Grace to you and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our text for this evening is from the Passion account. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. This is our text. Dear friends, sisters, and brothers in Christ Jesus, Our, our text this evening finds the Roman governor Pontius Pilate caught between fear and frustration. Pilate's just pulled Jesus back uh, for a final private audience because part of him not probably a faithful part, I think maybe the superstitious part of him was starting to fear that this Galilean might be more than a mere man. Of course, he's also, on the other hand, afraid of the crowd and afraid of the Jewish authorities and what might happen if things get out of hand and if word gets back to Caesar. But at the same time, you can hear the frustration. You can hear... You could practically hear in his voice his, his, the exasperation of an imperial bureaucrat faced with an uncooperative local who won't answer the question. Don't you know, Pilate says, that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus sets him straight. You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Pilate's fundamental mistake here is imagining that he and the political and military power that he represents really have any sort of ultimate say over the fate of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, granted, under the circumstances, it's an easy mistake to make. To Pilate, the, the man standing before him, this man who has now been beaten within an inch of his life, looks like just another misguided would-be Messiah from the sticks, someone to be crushed underfoot, or maybe a hapless victim of Jewish religious debate and political intrigue. Someone who ultimately is not really a threat. And I think for us too, sometimes it's easy to make that mistake. Sometimes it's easy to get so caught up in the pathos of this story that we imagine that Jesus is ultimately a victim. A victim of, of betrayal and injustice like so many people before and so many since. And of course, from a human point of view, that's true. But John and Jesus remind us that there is a much greater truth, a much greater reality at work here. Because, of course, this Jesus of Nazareth is not just an itinerant rabbi from Galilee. He is also, as John informs us at the beginning of his gospel, the word through whom all things were made, who was with God in the beginning, who is God. He is the one, as Jesus himself says, who is before Abraham was. Jesus is the one whose merest word saying, I am, makes the soldiers, the arresting soldiers fall down in the Garden of Gethsemane. Pilate believes that he has the power of life or death over Jesus. But the truth is, at that very moment, 
as they speak, hidden within this bleeding, half-dead Galilean is the power that upholds the universe, the power that has numbered every hair on Pilate's head and every heartbeat of his allotted days, who knit Pilate together in his mother's womb, and who even now upholds Pilate's very existence by his power. And this same Jesus, this same Son of God, planned this moment from before the creation of the world with his Father. Which means that if Jesus goes to the cross, it is ultimately because he chooses to. Which means that Jesus faces one final temptation. In our midweek Lenten services, we've been discussing the topic of temptation, and we've been looking specifically at Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, the three temptations that are presented to him by the devil. Good Friday presents Jesus with one final temptation. Now, John doesn't actually narrate this, uh, so you'll have to forgive me. I'm cheating a little bit. But we heard it actually on Sunday in our Passion account from the Gospel of Mark. When Jesus is on the cross and the bystanders and the religious leaders come to him and they say, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. It's interesting, in Luke's gospel, Luke's gospel is the one we've been looking at in our midweek services. In Luke's gospel, some variation of that taunt is, is shouted at Jesus three times, matching the three temptations that the devil presents him in the wilderness. And, and they're all, they all come in this, some variation of the, this form, the same form actually that the devil uses when he tempts Jesus to turn stone into bread, if you are the Christ, save yourself. If you are the Christ, save yourself. Now, I don't know that anyone there actually means it as temptation, Right? They mean it as mockery because they think there's no way that he could come down from the cross. And yet, in that mockery is the voice of the tempter presenting a temptation under the most extreme circumstances for Jesus to use his power to serve and to save himself. We talked over, over Lent about how the, the temptations that Jesus faces kind of come in, in these three flavors. There's temptation of the, the flesh to meet one's bodily needs. There's the temptation of, of the world to grab hold of power. And there's the temptation, a spiritual temptation, um, to test God. And, and here in this moment, you, you almost get all three flavors of temptation in, in one. You have that temptation of the flesh to save his physical life, you have temptation of, of the worldly temptation to grab hold of power and overthrow his enemies. And finally, you have the spiritual temptation not to trust in God, his Father. Because, of course, Jesus could come down from the cross. As he himself says in the Gospel of Matthew, when Peter tries to defend him in the Garden of Gethsemane, if he wanted, he could call on his father to send 12 legions, that's 72,000, by the way, 12 legions of angels to rescue him. But then says Jesus, how would the scriptures be fulfilled? And what are nails to the Son of God? 
He knows every atom of iron in each of those nails and calls it by name. He could dissolve them at a word. And so what ultimately keeps Jesus on the cross that day is not rope or nails or Roman soldiers. What keeps Jesus on the cross is love. His love for you. In his love for you, he is choosing to bear the full consequence of sin so that you don't have to. And if the Son of God is willing to bear torture and humiliation and dereliction and death out of love for you, what in your life could possibly be bigger than that love? Certainly there is no temptation you face that is bigger than his love. And there is no sin you've committed no matter how heinous, that is bigger than his love. And there's no circumstance in your life, no matter how intractable, no matter how heartbreaking, that is bigger than his love. Not even death itself is bigger than his love. And the love that died for you on the cross is also the love that lives for you. And the love that reigns for you with the power that numbers the molecules and upholds the motion of the galaxies. And he is at work in all things for your good. So trust in him. In every trial in every temptation, in every joy, in every sorrow, on every day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.